Actually, how did I look at this? Just zero access to go to Russia for like a weekend. Just some stupid mistakes from that. That's it. Graphics not group or to turn out. Graphics very very clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all the internships I did, I think I enjoyed in VR. It's being broadcast. Okay. Uh, Justin works in the office of the uh, CEO at ATI Graphics, which is part of AMD. Uh, He's, uh, before that, he uh, got his PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Before that, he was a UC Davis undergraduate, so coming home a little bit. Thank you very much for coming up. Oh, sure. Hey, you yeah. And feel free to uh, ask questions pretty much throughout. We want to make sure we uh, uh, keep them busy. Yeah, so if, yeah, if you have questions, go ahead and stop, ask me. This is sort of three different presentations that I'll try to squeeze into the time. Um, so the first presentation I'm going to give is actually adapted from a talk that Kayvon from Stanford gave at SIGGRAPH 2008, which was an excellent talk just on sort of how GPUs in general work. Um, and sort of I've adapted some of his slides because it, it was a great talk, so I had to give a shout out to him. But the basic idea here was going to uh, get an idea of how GPUs work in general. And the reason you want to know this is because writing, when you, if you know in general how they work, you'll do a better job of actually designing algorithms that run on the GPU because you know you might have this uh, immense amount of power that's sitting in your GPU, but you can easily write uh, application decelerators by writing the wrong algorithm. <laughs> I mean, it's it's quite easy to you know pound something out and then you run it and it runs ten times slower. So um, let's sort of talk about. CPU evolution. So if you look at the simplest CPU, um, they do three things. They fetch an instruction, they decode that instruction, then they execute. Rinse and repeat. That's all they do. Fetch, decode, execute. Uh, you know, the simplest one, so if you've taken any architecture classes, I'm sure you've built something that does this, which does some multi-cycle operations. So on phase one of the clock, it loads instruction. Phase two, it decodes, register read. Phase three, executes. And phase four, writes back the results. So you know, this is pretty simplistic. If you've taken any architecture, I guarantee you've built something that does this. Uh, of course, you know that. You know, if you move on to the next evolution of CPUs, you realize that you know we're doing fetch, decode, execute, but in this multi-phase cycle, we're kind of wasting time because when we're fetching, decode's doing nothing. When we're doing decode, the other units are doing nothing. So the first thing we'd like to do is we can pipeline this. So let's throw some pipeline stages in there. So while I'm fetching, uh, instruction four, instruction three will decode, instruction two will be executing, instruction one will be writing back. So we're basically doing four things at once. We're just doing different parts of the pipeline every cycle. Um, so if you look at a modern CPU, they use longer and longer pipelines because you would actually uh, you want to have as many things in parallel as possible. But the problem is, is once you have these really long pipelines, you start having branch delay and memory latency problems because you, know, you have dependent operations. So it takes a long time for memory to come back, but I need that for my next operand, so I have to put bubbles into my pipeline. Or let's say there's a branch delay. I don't know what instruction to fetch yet because it's dependent on some value. So this ends up becoming a problem. So then for CPUs, what they started doing is to tackle the latency problem, you start throwing huge caches. And we're talking huge, huge, huge caches. You look at the die, you know, a huge percentage of that chip is dedicated to caching. Um, so caches are great because they help you with memory latency. Um, they're not as fast as your registers. Uh, you can, you know, they have a problem where if you miss, you can actually take a little bit of a penalty, but they help quite a bit because you get this fast access to local memory. Then you also add in branch prediction. So you add in all this extra hardware to basically guess which way a branch is going to go so that you can always fetch the right instruction as you're going down this instruction stream. So they're fairly accurate, uh, but of course they're painful when they're wrong. You do extra work, so you waste power. Um, so next thing you do is then you throw in some out-of-order logic. 
So you're still spending most of your time waiting. Like a modern CPU doesn't do much work. It spends most of its time waiting to either get instructions back or figure out what branch to do. So you try to, you know, you add out of order execution. So you're going to execute whatever instructions ready to go whenever possible, and you're going to exploit LP as much as possible. Um, it's very hard to implement. I could be wrong on this, but I'm fairly certain some of the first teams that developed uh, Thomas Lugo's algorithm for some of the IBM projects said, had they known afterwards how hard it would be, they never would have done it in the first place. Uh, if you can talk to the MIPS guys when they first did the first out-of-order MIPS core, it was a significant amount of effort to do out-of-order execution. And I would argue that traditional CPUs are basically at the limit of what you can do. You are not doing anything faster on sequential programs other than making your clock faster. And even we're starting to see where we're get, going to hit that point where we can't really go much faster. So you, you now see the rise of multi-core CPUs. So instead of seeing a single core CPU that goes faster, they just plunk down two of them, now four of them, and then you'll see six of them, eight of them, however many you want. And that's just because we can't make that single core any faster. So you basically have to do parallelism. So that's sort of CPU evolution in a very quick nutshell. So what does a modern graphics API do? Well, it's going to take vertices, some chunk of data, has some fixed function logic, does some operation, generates, uh, or you basically have fixed function logic that take vertices, some program that operates on those vertices, you generate geometry, uh, geometry shader does some operation on that geometry, some fixed function logic, pixel shader, and there's some other pixel or fixed function logic. So yellow is programmable, red is uh, fixed. So if you you know these three stages are basically the same thing. That's sort of the rise of the the unified shader model. But you have basically some fixed function, and then this computational units. If anyone has a question, please stop me, because I'll warn you now. I will just bulldoze through this pretty quickly. So if you don't if you don't stop me, I'll just keep going. So let's look at a simple program. So if we're doing a diffuse shader. So we're going to shade this surface. All we really need to know is the normal direction of our surface, direction to the light, and our view direction. And we can shade the surface. And a simple program to do that is basically you sample a value. You do the dot product of the light direction and the normal. Uh, you're going to clamp it. That's your diffuse component. And you return your com diffuse component of that, that shader. The nice thing about this is that for every point on the surface of this sphere that we're shading, I don't care about any information from any other point on the surface because all I need is what's local information to me. I just need to know my normal, the direction to the light, and the view. So I don't need to know, share any other information. What language is this? This is probably um, HLSL. I haven't shown a lot of examples in class, so. Yeah, so this is just GLSL, HLSL. It's, just a, it's a graphics shading language. So the important thing to note is that every invocation of this program is independent. Shading. There's no explicitly posed par exposed parallelism. So if I'm writing this shader as a graphics developer, I don't think about parallelism here. You could say there is some because I'm doing these short little vector types. I'm ignoring you know, short vector types. But in general, there's no exposed parallelism. Everything is just a program that sequentially runs and shades a fragment. So on a GPU, what would happen is you have the shader. It's compiled to some, or this is uh, some assembly level. So this would be like pixel shader 3 assembly. It doesn't really matter. It's basically, I have very simplistic operations. I do multiplies, I do mads, I do clamps, I do moves. So it's basically a, a very simple assembly language. I have one fragment that comes in, and I generate one fragment out. So this program runs on fragments. But as it's running on this fragment, it's very sequential. So I'm going to do a load via the sample instruction. I'm going to do a multiply, a mad, a mad, a clamp, multiply, 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 move. So it's very sequential uh, programming. So you might ask, what's the minimum that I need to execute this shader? So let's keep it simple. We're not going to worry about sequential execution speed. Don't worry about ILP. Don't worry about instruction level parallelism. So what do I need to execute this program? is that very first simple processor you saw. Something that does fetch, decode, execute, and it has register files, so it writes back. So it's basically back to the simplest of dirt simple processors. So we're going to basically execute the shader. We have some data that comes in. We run it through our little fetch, decode, execute unit here, which is doing plotting along, doing simple as possible as it goes through these instructions. So is one core enough? One of these little cores. How can we make one of these little cores do what we need to do? 
So if you look at current GPUs, they do one teraflop of computation. We cheat a little bit because we say mul is two operations. So if you don't, if you consider a, a mul add as, or so a mul add is two operations. If you consider a mul add one floating point operations, okay, it's fine. It's 500 um, billion operations per second. But if you consider mul add two operations, it's a teraflop. So um, let's say, you know, we have to have a 500 gigahertz processor if we assume that we can execute one cycle per instruction. So obviously, that, that's, that's not going to work. You know, you're not going to build this little bitty single processor that goes at 500 gigahertz and plows through all this computation. So you know, what's, what, what the GPU does is it says, wait a minute, we have this thing we're shading, but they're all independent. So let's throw down two cores, because we'll have one core operating on one f set of fragments, another core running on another set of fragments. And the reason we can do this is every invocation is independent for simple graphics. Of course, if two is good, we might as well throw down four. So we'll have four cores running on four different machines. And if four is good, we might as well throw down 16. So let's have 16 cores all running on 16 independent fragments all at the same time. But let's say for our application, we need to do 128 things every cycle. So should we throw down 128 cores? So we have 128 of these little cores, all independent cores operating at the same time, doing different things for each of them. Well, one big problem with this is how do you feed all these cores? How do you actually get instructions to all these cores so that they all have their own 128 independent instruction streams? Well, the GPU, they, you, know, you think data parallel. So graphics hardware requires you to process lots of items that share the same shader. So you have lots of vertices that are all doing the same shader, lots of geometry shader, things that are doing the same shader, lots of pixels that are all doing the same shader. You know, you're running the same basic program. So what you do is you basically, you're going to share the cost of fetch decode across many ALUs. So when I fetch an instruction, I want to use it on multiple ALUs. And this is SIMD processing. So if this is too slow, let me know. If too fast, let me know. So SIMD, of course, is single instruction, multiple data. So what we have is we fetch an instruction, we decode that instruction, but we give it to eight units or some other number of units. So we basically operate on multiple units in parallel. So one thing I would point out is that SIMD processing does not imply SIMD instructions. So SIMD instructions, such as SSE, you'll see on sort of Intel and AMD processors, or Larabee, which has explicit 16-wide SIMD instructions, uh, modern GPUs from AMD and NVIDIA do not have explicit SIMD instructions. The hardware manages the SIMD processing for you. You basically request, operate on a million things, and the hardware takes care of chunking it up and working on it in parallel on these SIMD units. You have no way of controlling that. Whereas if you're using SSE as the programmer, you explicitly say, do this number of operations on four things at a time or 16 things at a time. So if we go back to the the single core, we have eight things coming in. They all operate on the exact same program because we have you know, one fetch unit, one decode unit, eight ALUs. So we fetch eight things, run our program, produce eight things. And that's how we're gonna basically be able to do 128 things in parallel with not so many instruction streams. So here, we have 16 cores, each of those cores operating on eight things. So that gives us 128 ALUs that are operating in parallel. So we have 16 instruction streams. Each instruction stream operates on eight things at a time. Yeah. What part of the context is uh, of the context is shared, and what is replicated? So yeah, you'll you'll see in here. I have basically context data. So the context data. I mean, it's going to depend on the particular machine. But you'll notice uh, the register file, I have it partitioned. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But basically, the way you can think of a GPU is its register file is a giant chunk of memory. So it's just a, a junk, chunk of memory that is partitioned up for uh, how many threads you want to run it, or wave fronts, waves, whatever you want to call them, running in parallel, which I'll talk about in a second. But so the, you know, independent data would be you know, your registers. My R0 is different from my next guy's R0, which is different from the next guy's R0. The program counter would most likely be shared as a shared piece of context data because everyone's at the same point in the in the program counter. There's probably actually mask data to handle branching, things like that. So I'd like to sort of you know mention again. You know we're basically doing 
you know, X cores could be working on primitives, so we could have X things being doing geometry shader, we could have Y things being vertex shaders, Z things running pixel shaders, N cores doing compute kernels, it doesn't matter, it's all compute in the end, and you're just using this one set of ALUs to do the compute, even though it might be different types of things. <laughs> so, uh, one big problem with SIMD processing is what about branching? So we have these eight ALUs. They're, we want to execute this program, right? We're going along happily executing this program. What happens though when we get to this if statement and we're saying if x is greater than zero? Because each one of these ALUs has a different x value. And it turns out that uh, ALUs one and two and four, that if statement's true. And the other ones, it's false. So when you're doing SIMD processing, how do you handle this? That, you know, in this case, three of them want to go one way and five of them want to go the other way. Well, unfortunately, with GPUs or any SIMD processor, you're going to have to go both ways. So you have to basically execute three on one way, and you have some mask that tells the other guys, hey, you're not allowed to compute. You flip that mask, then you execute the other side. So uh, one big problem with SIMD processing, let's say I have eight branches. I have a sequence of eight branches, or eight if statements. Each if statement turns out it wants ALU1, the next if statement wants ALU2, next one wants three, so on, until we get to ALU8. That means we could run the exact sort of section of code eight times, because we have to execute each branch of that sequences of branches. So in the worst case, we're actually going to get one-eighth performance. Okay, one-eighth performance doesn't sound that bad. How often are you going to do that? But on an NVIDIA GPU, this width is 32. So you could, at worst, do 30, one 30-second 30 performance. On AMD GPUs, it's even worse. That's 64. So on AMD GPUs, we operate on 64 things at a time. So if you have a very bad code written in such a way, you could conceivably run at 1 64th performance just because you wrote your branches in a, in a poor way. <laughs> so while you can branch, you know, there is a penalty to it. It's not, it's not free. You know, the good news is once you get back at the back end of this branch and everybody merges together into the same flow of ex uh, execution, of course everybody goes back and everyone's working together again. Uh, I would also say, I mean, all modern GPUs also have the ability, if everybody's true, you only execute it once, and if everybody's false, you, ex you only execute it once. It's only when you basically have this disparity where some people want to go left and some people want to go right, you basically have to go both ways. Any questions on sort of branching? Sort of try to breeze through this pretty quickly. Okay, so to me, this is where GPUs sort of do their best, is how do you handle stalls? So if you remember back with CPUs, the big problem with uh, stalls is that you basically, you know, I, I have a value I need from memory, but it's being computed by somebody ahead of me or it's in memory, and those accesses to memory take a long time. So, you know, at worst case, it could be hundreds to thousands of cycles till that piece of data comes back. And that's why modern CPUs basically, in general, sit there doing nothing, is they spend most of their time waiting for data to come back from memory, because they operate so much faster than memory does. And GPUs don't have large, fancy caches. So they have small caches, but they don't have megabytes of cache like you would have on a modern CPU. So they, you, know, you can't rely on the cache to solely prevent you from having this uh, latency of this stall. The key is that GPUs have lots and lots of fragments. So they have lots of things being run in parallel. So the key is that we're going to interleave the processing of one group of fragments with other groups of fragments to cover this latency. So it's basically, the way it works is I have, I always have something ready to go, and as soon as somebody needs to stall, they're thrown off the ALU core and somebody else is swapped on. So if we look at this, let's say we're, this is our machine, we have eight fragments, they're running, running along, and then we get to this point where this uh, wavefront number one basically says, I need some memory. So it needs something from memory. It's not going to be able to run until it gets down here. So if we're just running one set of fragments at a time, what's going to happen is we're not going to do anything from this point to this point because nothing you know, we can't run because we're waiting on data. What GPUs do is they have other sets of fragments ready to go immediately, and we can very lightweight switch to another set of fragments. And by lightweight, I'm talking numbers of cycles. So basically, we can go from... Wave, uh, wavefront 1 to wavefront 2 in a matter of cycles. So it's very fast to switch between these wavefronts. And is that because the, all the context is in register file? Or something? One, they're very lightweight. So the, yeah, the data is basically stored on chip. So there is some local store that stores that uh, context data. But one, you know, 
another reason I would say is that GPUs are free from having to deal with sort of uh, a lot of the issues that a CPU would have to deal with when you're dealing with inter-process switching. Where, where there, there's lots of protection. You know, here there's, everything's being executed in, in sort of one set of data, so you're not worrying about protection. You're relying on the programmer to make sure that they don't write where they're not supposed to write. So the, the context data is very lightweight, and so it's very easy to switch, but also the, the, the data is actually stored there, so it's easy for them to swap in and out. And it also comes to the register files, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, is it like stored in uh, the, the threads that you can use next? Is it like a first out, first, first in, first out buffer, or? Uh, part of that is secret sauce. <laughs> uh, I mean, a lot of it is. So the thing is, you have to realize that if we're not talking about compute, we're just talking about graphics. Let's say you're doing DirectX 10 style shaders. You know, you're going to have geometry shaders, vertex shaders, pixel shaders, and you know other things going on inside the machine. So you're basically swapping between. You're not just swapping between pixel shaders. You're also swapping between vertex shaders and geometry shaders. So the exact rules for who swaps when is sort of. Uh, secret sauce, like you know, it's the driver basically can decide what preference. And the way our hardware works is there's an arbiter that basically can arbitrate between what thread what threads are going, and it's somewhat programmable, except it's only programmable by us basically, because if you do the wrong thing, you could you know you know bad things could happen. But so in general, with a certain type of program, in general, it's round robin basically scheduling. But part of it's going to depend on latencies because all this thing, all these things are happening in parallel. So you, you basically have ALU, you have memory. The, the, you know, those things are basically, you can think of them as two sets of machines that are doing their own thing in parallel. So depending on what's going on at any one time will determine the order. So it's, it's in general, non-deterministic. So in general, yes, it's this round robin, but you can't say for certain because at runtime, you know, whatever's running on the machine at the time might basically change how that happens. Same <laughs> So if you look, you know, basically we're going to run Wavefront 1, it stalls, we run Wavefront 2 till it stalls, we wait, run Wavefront 3 till it stalls, Wavefront 4 till it stalls. By the time Wavefront 4 stalls, it turns around, you know, we can run Wavefront 1 again. So basically we've, we never stalled the machine. We were all constantly working. We were always doing some work. And this is sort of the, uh, what you'll sometimes see is throughput computing or GPGPU or graphics. Uh, for now, I'll call it throughput computing. Because basically what we're doing is we're increasing the time of one wavefront. So if you look, by doing this, we might have made this program actually for it, for this wavefront, it actually took slightly longer for it to run. So we, we were sacrificing the length of time for one program to run to guarantee that the, we get maximum throughput. So we get as much data through the machine as possible. So latency might be a little bit longer because you basically waited a little bit longer than you had to. But what's more important to a GPU is that we kept the ALUs busy as much as possible. So we were basically doing as much computation as we could. And that's sort of any of these throughput devices, that's, that's what you're doing, is you're sacrificing sequential speed for a program for the sort of group speed of everything getting done faster. So how does this all work in, in generic? So we have fetch unit, decode unit, some number of ALUs, and then we have a pool of context storage, which I've been saying is the register file. Um, so while GPUs don't have a large cache, they do have really large register files. So we're talking megabytes of register file storage. And the reason it's that big is, let's say we've written a program like that diffuse shader that only needs a couple of registers. It only needs two to three registers for all of its context. What that means is that we can partition this register file into a lot of chunks. So we basically can store lots of wavefronts in this giant pool of, register of memory. So that means that we can switch between any of these guys. So I think this is around 30, uh, 33 through 30 uh, context. It's just a an abstract number. But what that means is once this guy stalls, we could switch between any of the other ones. So what that means is that your latency hiding behavior is better because you have more work to select from to actually hide the latency of these memory accesses. So what that means is the amount of ALU work you have to do per memory access is lower for a single threat or a single wavefront because you have more work to select from. Does that sort of make sense? And that's because we have light register usage, so we have more context that we can have in flight. So on the other end of this, the worst latency hiding behavior is let's say we have a program that needs 100 registers. If we have, in, that means that we could only store four contexts. That means that when this guy stalls, we only have three different contexts we can select from. 
What that means is we have to do lots more ALU work. So between every memory fetch, you have to do a lot more ALU work to cover that, high, uh, that latency. So if you remember that graph, we're always trying to keep the ALUs busy. And if you want to keep those ALUs busy, you have to have a certain number of ALU operations to every memory operation. And when you have only four contexts in flight at once, you have to have lots of memory accesses, or lots of ALU operations ready to go for every single memory access so that you can cover that latency, because you don't have anybody else to switch between. Or you have fewer things to switch between. Okay. So the sort of three keys to success of a GPU is you're going to use many slim down cores. You're going to have them all run in parallel. So you have lightweight cores, lots of them all running in parallel. You're going to pack those cores full of ALUs. So uh, and you're sharing the instruction stream bandwidth. And so you have two options. One is you can do explicit SIMD vector instructions. So that would be more like uh, a Larrabee style machine where you explicitly say, run on this 16 pieces of data. Or you can do option two, which is implicit sharing by hardware, which is what uh, a modern GPU does, is the hardware determines what data are grouped together. And sort of the big one is you avoid latency stalls by interleaving the execution of multiple things in parallel. So you're constantly always bringing something new on the machine so you keep the ALUs as busy as possible. OK. So here's an abstract view of the 4870, which uh, I will apologize. I will probably call R700 or R770 every once in a while, because that's what we call it. But the 4870, which is the commercial name of our current GPU, one of our current GPUs, this is sort of an abstract view of the hardware. So uh, we have basically the register file down here. We have some special purpose texture units. Uh, we have these little processor cores, which operate on a single piece of element, a single piece of data. And inside that, there are actually five LUs. I'll get into that a little more detail. This is just sort of giving you an abstract. But there are 10 of them. So you know, that's, that's a lot of ALUs every cycle that, that are ready to crunch numbers for you. So you know, all these little, little bitty yellow squares are basically an ALU that can do an operation every cycle. Uh, and, you know, and so when, we, when you see modern GPUs say that there's 1.2 teraflops or 1 teraflop, you know, they're talking about ALUs that do real math. They're not talking about ALUs hiding in the texture units or ALUs hiding in the Z units or all that, which is sort of what used to happen is you could always bring in those guys and try to say there's more flops. But you know, there are really that many ALUs in these machines. So, so you said the width of the SIMD was 64. It, it says 16 units. Right. So on AMD GPUs, the width of the wavefront is 64, but there are 16 cores. And what happens is there is a sub-cycle that basically happens. So it it's like NVIDIA. Oh, okay. So basically, it takes four sub-cycles, four of these cycles for a 64-wide wavefront to actually be processed. But all, you know, so there are 16 of these units. It takes four cycles for it to process all 64 elements. And then there's actually, um, it's similar. So if you, if you look at CUDA, they talk about um, NVIDIA has the same width. Half warp. Right. Yeah, they have, they have the same thing where you have fewer number of ALUs than the width, but they also have a half warp. Whereas we have, we basically operate on two wave fronts at a time. So we do uh, four cycles on wave front A, four, four, uh, four cycles on wave front B, and you go back and forth between these two. So is that is it fair to say basically it's taking you four sub cycles to change your program counter and fetch the next instruction? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so one thing when I uh, show the yeah. sort of ISA of the machine, you'll see that um, the way uh, this hardware actually operates, it's a clause based machine. So it's a little more complex than that because basically once the ALU starts on a chunk of code, it knows that it will. there is no way to stop that chunk of code. So it's actually pretty easy for it to fetch because once it enters into an ALU clause, it's only going to execute things from that ALU clause. Okay. So that's sort of a high-level view of, of throughput computing in sort of abstract. All right. So the last year, there was the 3800 series, which was R670. So if you go to like Wikipedia and type in R670 or RV670, you'll probably find more information than I'll be able to give you. Uh, so if you look at R670, so you know it's going to look familiar. You have some chunk of ALUs sitting here. You have some special purpose logic <laughs> lying around. Uh, and this is sort of the you know, the unified shader model that you basically have one set of ALUs that do op operations, but then you have, you have a scan converter for when you're doing pixel shading operations, a geometry sh uh, assembler when you're doing geometry shader, vertex assembly when you're doing vertex shader. So you have all the special purpose logic that helps set up things for the ALU core, 
But the ALU core itself is the same for all, all sort of computation types. So this machine had a 256-byte um, or bit interface, DDR4. Uh, it was actually the first GPU that could do double precision computing. So we could actually do double precision operations uh, in the GPU. It's kind of funny because uh, people have begged for double precision. Like, we need double precision. And then you give double precision to them, and they don't use it. Because so. <laughs> it turns out, I think a lot of people don't, you know, they think they need double precision, but they, they don't actually <coughs> absolutely need it. So uh, before, I'm going to skip through a lot of this. But it had a half, a half a teraflop was its peak speed. So it was just at 500 gigaflops is how fast, how many computations per second can do. And it had 320 stream processors. So if you look at it in the marketing material, they'll say stream processors. That's really just an ALU. So I'll talk about where that number comes from. So if we move on to the 4800 series, it's going to look very similar. It's laid out uh, slightly differently, but it looks very similar. So we have 800 highly optimized stream processing units. Again, 800 ALUs is the way to read that. Uh, so the SIMD core layout is different. So it's actually kind of neat. If you look at this picture, and if you search online, you can actually find a die photo of this chip, which is about, if you take a dime out, that's how big this chip is when it first came out. You know, it's basically the, the die could fit on a dime. You could actually see, you know, you could look across it, you can see the SIMD lanes, you can see the texture units, and you can see uh, there's some junk around it, but then you can also see the, I have a die photo next, but it's kind of neat. If you go online, you can find a photo of it, and you can actually see sort of the structure of the chip. So it has a much more sane cache. So the cache on the previous chip was interesting to say the least. So I would say the new one has a more sane cache. And as sort of going forward, the caches on GPUs are becoming more CPU-like. They're just a lot smaller. Uh, it has a different memory architecture. Uh, and blah, blah, blah. So that's marketing speak. So we'll just move on. OK. So this is an actual photo of the die. So it's kind of neat, because you can actually see the SIMD lanes. You can see the texture units. This is uh, GDR5 memory interface and all that stuff. And this is secret stuff that no one, no one knows what is. Um, so as I said, it has 10 SIMD cores. So each of these cores has 80. So basically, there are 10 SIMD cores. Each of those cores has 80 32-bit stream processors. Again, read ALU. So it has each of these cores has 80 ALUs that every cycle are ready to do sort of start working on something. There are 40 texture units. So if you take those 40 texture units divided by 10, you can see there are four texture units for every 70 lane. Let's say. So one thing about the RGPUs is that they have a very high ALU to memory ratio. So we can do a lot of math. But GPUs in general, it's actually pretty hard to, to peek out the math units because there's a lot of ALUs. You have to give them something to do for every memory operation. So I would say, you know, we are a bit ALU heavy. But. So the interface is GDR5, but it runs at 115 gigabytes per second. That's pretty fast if you think about what a modern CPU can do. It's, I mean, they're starting to get close to that, but they're still not that close to, to what you can get on a, a GPU. So the die size is 26 millimeters squared. That turns out to be close to a dime. Um, and this is all sort of just saying how great it is compared to the past GPU. But if you ever work for a company, you get to take marketing slides and try to make sense out of them. OK. So where does this 800 stream processor units come from? Uh, shaders, whatever you want to call them. So there are 10 pipes. Uh, I like to call them pipes for the cores. Basically, there are 10 of these SIMD lanes as they go across. Our wavefront size is 64, as I was saying earlier. Uh, we call it wavefronts, and video calls them warps. Uh, a lot of people would call them vectors. So there are 16 cores that complete one instruction for a wavefront over four cycles. Because we do 16, of, 16 elements, 16 elements, 16 elements, 16 elements. And then we move on to the so we have two wave fronts that are interleaved in execution. So it's four cycles of one, four cycles of two, four cycles of one. They ping pong back and forth. Each of these cores has five ALUs. Again, ALUs, stream processing units. The five units are organized as a VLIW instruction machine style machine. So for those who don't know, a VLIW is a very long instruction word machine, which means that you basically are programming these five ALUs with an instruction packet that has five things at once. Uh, you cannot think of this as five independent scalar machines because there are limitations on the ports to the register file. So there are some limitations. So they're not completely independent, but they are somewhat independent. So if you take that five times 16, 
that gives you 80 times 10, that gives you 800. So there, that's where you get the 800 ALUs that you know every clock. Okay, so each of these uh, cores, there are uh, these 80 units. There is a 16 kilobyte local data share, which uh, I will probably slip into saying LDS, which if you've used CUDA, that would be the PDC, or there are similar structures. So basically, this unit has this little local memory that it can actually use to share data, so that any, any wavefront that's running on this SIMD can write and read to this memory and use it to share data between those wavefronts. So that's how you can basically share data between, um, between wavefronts. But again, it's only wavefronts on this SIMD. There's also a global data share, which is 16 kilobytes on this. So that means any wavefront on the machine can share data through this global data share, uh, which is something you, you won't see in CUDA. Um, but to get to that, you've got to program at a fairly low level. Uh, then there are four texture units, and the different texture units handle different types of data. So they might handle um, you know, bilinearly interpolated data, vertex data, so there are different kinds of data that they'll deal with. And so earlier we talked about how you have to basically switch between these, all these different wavefronts. So you have these wavefronts that are constantly coming in and on off the machine. That's actually a fairly complex task, and I believe when you guys asked you know, how it's scheduled. So what happens is there's this, actually this thing which we call the ultra-threaded dispatch processor which is a really fancy name for a sequencer. So its job is to sequence who goes on the machine what. And part of its job is to make sure that anything that was requested from memory is actually back from memory. So you know, it, it, its whole job is to make sure things are ready to go when they go. So it's actually in itself a fairly complex little computer that takes care of doing all the sequencing operations. And as I was saying earlier, there's actually some arbitration values it can use to determine who sequences when. But again, that's not programmable by sort of uh, anyone outside of the driver team. So if you look at these stream processing units, you'll notice there's a there's five of them because I was saying that they're it's a five-way VLW. So there's uh, the way we term these. There's the X, Y, Z, W unit, and then there's the T unit, which stands for transcendental. And the transcendental unit can do everything that the other units can do, but it can also do things like sine, cosine, square root. Uh, I would tell you, though, these are good enough for graphics, sine, cosine, square root type operations. So a lot of times we will talk to people who are doing scientific computation, and they think it's great that we have this sine unit that can go so fast. But it's horribly inaccurate for scientific computation. It's only meant for graphics. So we have those five units. Um, and that's basically about the, with that little when you're programming that, you're actually programming five ALUs at once. And to give you an idea what this instruction set looks like, this is assembly text for that machine. So this is the actual, I mean, it's not in binary form, but it's text form of the instructions that that machine will run. So you notice there are these things called clauses. So we have ALU groups of instructions. So those are things that run on the ALU. We have texture instructions. Those run on texture units. ALU, texture, ALU. So the way our machines work is you have the ALU units, you have texture units, and you have the memory controller. Those things all happen in parallel all the time. So you can think of, this is sort of like three programs on one. There's a control flow program, there's an ALU program, and there's a texture program. So what happens is you're constantly being switched between these programs. So you might be executing ALU, and then once you want texture, you're switched to the texture unit. It runs the texture program. Once you're done, you're switched back and you run the ALU program. This doesn't show uh, control flow, but it's the same idea, that there's a control flow program, there's the ALU program, and then there's the um, texture program. So you'll notice that inside this, you'll see this like this instruction right here only has three little sub-instructions. So it has mul, mul, reciprocal. So it's using X, Y, and T. That's one of the sort of uh, problems with VLW machines is that you might not always be able to schedule all five units. So in this case, we're only using two-thirds of our machine, or three-fifths of our machine. If you look at this instruction right here, we're using all five units, so we're getting very good utilization. Uh, if you look at this instruction, we're only using two of the units, so we're only using two-fifths of our machine. So, you know, that's, that's not ideal. Uh, it's just, you know, that's, you know, if good code will use all the units, and, you know, bad code won't. But that's sort of what you have to live with when you deal with these VLW machines. So any questions about the... Sort of. All right. So you have the ALUs, they run the ALU program, and then you have these texture units, 
which run the texture program. So there are different kinds of um, texture units that do different kinds of filtering. You notice there's actually two layers of caching. So there's basically level one caches that talk to the SIMDs. They talk to a crossbar. And then they're not shown here, but then there's level two caches that talk to the memory controllers. So you know they're starting to look more similar to what a CPU style cache hierarchy would look like. But it's you know as a, you know you have ten L1 caches that talk to these L2 caches, and there are four of those, each for uh, memory channels. But other than that, you know these basically do texture filtering. Yes. How large are these caches? So these caches are I'm pretty. Ask. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're pretty small. These are, uh, I would have to double check, they're pretty small. I mean, I, I think we actually tell you what this is off the top of my head. Like, oh, uh, what kind are they? Um, uh, so they used to not, they used to be very strangely mapped. Um, they're not exactly direct mapped, they're not exactly set of show initiative. There's some secret sauce in there, but I would just say that they are becoming more like CPU caches. They store unfiltered or filtered? So the caches on these guys. These are the texture units. The caches store uh, basically um, compressed data, and then you uncompress it when it comes out. And that's actually, I mean, so some caches, I mean, that's sort of a, if you're actually building one of these, that's a question is do you store filtered data? Do you store unfiltered data? Do you store compressed data, uncompressed data? Um, all right, so if you look at this, this is sort of, you know, you have your L1 caches, texture units, they type a crossbar, they talk to L1 caches, they talk through a crossbar to L2 caches which talk to your memory controllers. Um, I don't remember if we said actually the size. So one thing you'll note is so our main memory bandwidth is 115 gigabytes per second. Our cache bandwidth is 480 gigabytes per second. So I mean, sort of the, the memory bandwidths on, on GPUs are, are, are pretty impressive. And the bandwidth between L1 and L2 is you know, 300, almost 400 gigabytes per second. Any, yes? So one thing that came up in class is um, I looked at the flipper chip, was yours. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it had embedded DRAM. Yes. And that makes things cheaper, and you guys like cheaper. And also, you'd have a higher bandwidth to it. Why don't you build anything with embedded DRAM? So, the problem with doing an embedded DRAM chip is it's great for consoles because that's a set market. That's a set SKU that basically I build that chip, it's always the same. The problem with doing embedded DRAM for sort of commodity devices is that you like to have a range of devices. So I might have, so if you look at the 4870 and the 4850, there's the same ASIC that drives those, but it uses different memory technologies. So the 4850 uses GDR3, whereas the 4870 uses GDR5, and it has a much higher bandwidth. So by having basically memory and chip uh, separate, it allows us to basically have different SKUs that do basically, um, you know, to meet market demands. Whereas with a console, it's a set market where I, I can dedicate all these resources and I just have as much as I need. So there's not even a single SKU where it would make sense to do it embedded? But then it's sort of, the thing is these all share the same, basically, same basic architecture. So even though there are, you know, for us we have the 4870, the 4850, which is the same ASIC, then there's the 4830 and the 48, or the 46, 7, I don't forget the numbers, but basically there's 710, 730, and 770. They all share the same architecture, even though they're different chips. And so any work you put into building sort of an embedded DRAM system is going to be hard for you to scale. And I think also just the costs aren't there for commodity devices, where for a console, you can take the cost of doing the design for the embedded DRAM system, and it will amortize since you basically never change that design. Or you might shrink it, but in general, it, it, it's, you don't have to worry about doing a family of processors. OK, sort of any other questions about basic AMD GPU architecture. Yes. I was wondering what the ratio of uh, compute to texture units is. You, I saw like four to one in the in the latest. So it's four to one. So it's um, basically. So it's a hard answer question to answer. So do you want to know how many ALU instructions you have to do to cover a memory <laughs> access, or there's different questions you could answer. So there are basically four units for every one SIMD. Right. So, so that's so that number. What's that number for your previous generation? So the previous generation that would have been four to one as well for the six seventy. Okay. Um, and then going back further than that. So. Just wondering if there's some trend over the years for that ratio. So I would say the ratio, at least for ours, is we've been making more and more ale use. So basically, the trend is that number is a little bogus. Basically, number of texture units per SIMD, but um, 
it, it's what you really care about is how many ALUs are there. So I would say the number of ALUs has gone up. So for every texture unit, or every texture unit, so there are four little texture units inside that one block. Mm -hmm. So for every one of those, we've been giving more and more ALUs. So what that means is that you have to do more and more, uh, you have to have very arithmetically dense code to actually hide the latency. And I would say that in, for our hardware, if you look back from previous generations to now, we've been throwing more ALUs in for every texture unit, which... Uh, is that a trend for the shaders? Like, are shaders getting more, uh, uh, like, some terms of math? Uh, actually, I would... Uh, well, one, it's easy to do. So it, it's... <laughs> It, it, you know, it, it's, it's much area-wise, it's much easier to throw down ALUs than it is to throw down these texture units. So I would say one reason is chip area, it's actually easier to put more ALU. Uh, I would say, I mean, we are starting to see game shader, um, shaders for games that are becoming more arithmetically complex. But I still, it's nowhere near as complex. It does not have the ALU density that our current shaders actually have. Uh, I mean, one thing you have to realize with games is that if you're a game developer, it, it needs to run, in general, on the most machines possible. So if you look at someone you know, like Blizzard, I believe they've, <laughs> they're still not on DirectX 9 um, because what they care about is they want to make sure that everybody in the world can play World of Warcraft on whether it's a cardboard box with you know, a tank <laughs> machine in it or this big honking. I mean, so there, there are very few games that really stress the machines because they kind of lag behind. Okay, so I'm going to... Sure. Um, so it sounds like you're getting a lot of pressure from the scientific community. Like you said, you added double precision on the ALUs and, and the square root and all that stuff, but it seems like you guys don't have... No, no, you need square root for graphics. So the square like, root is not, square root for graphics. Not, I know, I know it's for, but you said the scientific community was really glad you had square root and sign and all that stuff, but it seems like you guys don't have... Do you have some kind of CUDA type thing that scientific people would want to... Is all that? So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so one thing I would stress is the sine, cosine, square units are not used by scientific people purely because they are horrible, horrible precision. I mean, they, they are designed for graphics. You could maybe use them to jumpstart a better computation. So if you want to do some sort of, you know, Taylor Series expansion or something, you might use it to start to get a better answer. But in general, you would never, ever, ever want to use those in a scientific computation purely because they are not accurate. So a couple questions. Um, so uh, when when you see um, like there's an announcement of supercomputing last year. So the Oak Ridge guys announced that they reached the petaflop on Jaguar, <laughs> but what they didn't say in the press release was that they did the calculation in single precision floating right. point. And when you go to double precision, like on an Optron, the performance drops to I don't know, like about an eighth of what single precision floating point uh, performance is. What's the, what's the performance here? Uh, I, I'm sorry, yeah, thank you for reminding me. So if you look at this unit, there are basically, there are these four units, and then there's this fifth transcendental unit. So these are all single precision MAD units. So they do multiply add. So one thing I would, str on sort of any, our GPUs, if you do a multiply, you're actually only getting half an instruction because they, they are multiply add. So if you do multiply, you're not getting sort of the full use of it. But what happens when you do a double precision operation, what happens is basically these four units go together to do a double. So you could think of it as one-fifth, but it's really a little bit better than one-fifth. It's in between one-fifth and one-fourth because you can schedule one double precision operation and one single precision operation at the same time. So it's one-fifth the rate if you can't schedule a single, but a lot of times you actually can schedule in uh, a single uh, precision instruction because you actually have to do something else. So if you look at something like matrix, uh, matrix multiply, you actually don't, you, the performance you drop down isn't that much because that's actually it's not what limits the problem. But you know, a lot of times you can actually schedule in. So in general, it's one-fourth to one-fifth speed. Yes. How much um, design decision is influenced by GPU computing? Let's say for the double, because you know that's not used in games, but you still want so, to support I mean, like it. That, that was something that the architects determined that, hey, we can actually do this pretty easily, not much area, we'll, we'll, we'll put it in, because that's something that GPU compute wanted. I would have to say it's not used that heavily. I mean, it's used some, but it's not used that heavily. Um, but there are, I mean, both, I would say all the companies are, are now considering GPU compute as something important. So. There are definitely things, like if you look at the L, what we call the LDS, that's something that is not exposed in any graphics API, so it's only for compute. Same thing with GDS. 
Um, it must be used in the graphics API. Not in our hardware. So our hardware, those are specifically for use for compute. So uh, our competitors, some of their features are used for graphics, and then they were reused. But it was just determined that you know it didn't take that much area. And it was something they could put down. Do you anticipate that these additions of double precision and um, uh, shared local data storage would uh, would be used in games now that uh, DX11 also has a compute shader kind of? Well, they'll have to. I mean, I mean, if if they're using those compute languages, then they'll you know they'll they'll start being. Used. It goes back to restricting your games on the US platform. Right. Companies will not do that. Well, I mean, there'll always be some games who are DX11 only because they want to be on the the biggest machine. Some monstrous machine to run it. So there'll always be some games like that, and there are always also games that don't care and they want to run on as many things as possible. Is, is there any end to the trend? Uh, you know, each new graphics uh, processor that comes out, I got to go buy a new power supply for my machine. <laughs> <laughs> is there? Is there any? Is anybody talking about you know energy efficient GPU stuff? I mean, yeah, it, it's a, definitely a concern because I don't think people want a <laughs> 10 kilowatt power supply for their GPU <laughs> uh, and a nuclear reactor in the backyard to run it. But um, <laughs> you know, it, it is. I mean, basically, I would say if you look at GPU power envelopes, they've probably reached their peak already. So, or they're sort of you know leveling off. Uh, pretty well because it, it's not just the, the power th th that the user has to have for a power supply. You have to worry about energy density of the chip. You know the chip itself. You, you can't cool past a certain point. So you know, <laughs> all chip. You know CPUs and GPUs are getting to the point where that, that's an issue, right? You can't getting that heat out of the chip is a problem even. So it, it's not going to keep going forever. And so I, I would say that yes, you know that is much more of a concern than it used to be is making things energy efficient. Um, I'd say the other thing really changed the trend there is that maybe five years ago the drivers weren't very good at uh, doing two GPUs together and getting speed ups on them. Whereas I think the vendors have got really good now if you buy two GPUs and you put them in, you can make good use out of them for games. And that's for games. For games. <laughs> thus when people say, Oh I need this giant power supply, you know, how much do you really need? A lot of times now people are budgeting for having two GPUs and stuff. Now, actually, so our highest end card. So one thing I didn't mention is that our GPUs from the get go were designed. So the R770 or the 4870 was designed at the get go to be a um, mainstream card or high end mainstream card, and not an enthusiast card. So there's these segments in the GPU space. There's like the the crazy gamer who will spend obscene amounts of money to get whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. Then you have sort of the normal people, and then sort of people who all they care about is cost. So I would say that the 4870 was designed for this high-end mainstream segment. And from the get-go, it was designed to be ganged together with another one so that you would take two of those chips, and that's where the 4870X2, or what it's called the R700, comes from. Because by putting two of those GPUs together, we can have the best performance. And instead of designing for the best performance, we designed for this sort of you know, high-end mainstream ground, and then we put two of them together to get to the high-end. OK, so sort of leading into your question, uh, you know what do GPUs do better than or do well besides graphics? So image processing is sort of a given because you could argue that graphics is really image processing or they're very related. Uh, you can do things like computer vision. So one of my first projects at ATI was doing face recognition. So that's uh, me uh, being detected correctly with the uh, I think it's the editor of the German PC magazine. But um, so you can do computer vision, uh, video processing, game physics. So of course a big one, artificial intelligence. But outside of games, I, mean, I will say. <laughs> Games are is where the money's made. So, you know, we're never going to hurt game performance. So, yes, we're interested in putting G, you know general compute things into the compute into the pipeline, but until that is really important for games, it's going to be secondary to what's good for games. I mean, that's just the, re the financial reality. But we are concerned in things doing you know doing general compute. Financial modeling is actually a big place where GPUs do well. So, if you do Monte Carlo option pricing, it's highly parallel. A lot of financial modeling people are interested in GPUs. Fluid dynamics, oil and gas, you're looking for oil. So typically what you do when you look for oil is you set off an explosion or you hit the ground really hard. You have microphones and you listen to how things reflect and from that you can figure out what's underneath. So oil and gas people are very interested in GPUs because they want to compute computational biology. So one big one is folding at home. Um, how many of you guys know what folding at home is? So most of you, so you know, folding at home is basically this package that does in-body simulation on Molecules, and it's trying to figure out how proteins fold and unfold. 
So the current fastest client, or clients run on GPUs. I think the fastest one right now is unfortunately on NVIDIA, but until recently it was on ATI hardware had the fastest client. But you know, both the GPU clients are well, you know, quite a bit faster than cell clients or multi-core CPU clients. So certain operations, GPUs do compute really well. So putting my marketing hat on, why hasn't GP GPU taken off? You know, yes. What is ATI's answer to physics? So it's being worked on. <laughs> uh, so the GP GPU, uh, why hasn't that taken off? Well, I mean, one question is, is it actually, is it actually you know, is it that important? So if you look at some reviews of some games, it's actually claimed by, not by me, but other people, that it actually doesn't help the game that much. And you know, there's recently an article where people are talking about how they were actually turning off some of these effects because they felt like it, you know, it, it actually detracted from the, the game. But that's, you know. <laughs> but I would say one thing is that GPUs have rapidly evolved. So if you've been in GPUs for a while, it's astounding how fast they move. I would say even inside our company, the people who work on GPUs and the people who work on CPUs, the people who work on CPUs are often surprised at how fast GPUs move because CPU architects are used to five-year cycles. You know, you'll introduce an architecture, five years later you might introduce a new architecture, whereas GPUs, every year we're putting out a new architecture pretty much. I mean, if you look, almost every year there's a new family of GPUs from both vendors. So these things move quite fast. Uh, for people who don't do graphics, there are quite a few unfamiliar programming models. So it's actually, you know, if you're not used to graphics programming, it's not it, not exactly fun, you know, doing this programming unless you're used to it. Uh, and I would say the biggest one is the lack of industry standard API. So, you know, if I'm a big software developer, I'm not going to want to necessarily write in one particular language if it only works on one type of hardware. Because if I'm uh, ISV, I want my software to run on as many people as possible. So there's another reason too. And that is that you know the uh, a lot of people view GP GPU as you know a GPU on a machine, and so when you start looking at you know parallel configurations, well you say well GPU cluster well how many nodes is that right ten twelve hundred right well the supercomputer centers have you know hundred million dollar machines and those guys are really interested in it and coupling this stuff with the existing infrastructure is a real problem. Well, I know one problem also is that you know GPUs. At least has hurt that sort of market in the past is that GPUs are des you know not des it's not that they're designed to run but they're basically guaranteed for a short amount of time, whereas a lot of these big iron machines they're designed to sit in a center for an extended period of time, and so I believe most GPU vendors re until recently would not be willing to basically guarantee a part would stay for 10 years or something like that because we're, we're you know iterating so fast that you know we don't manufacture. GPUs from a couple years ago because we're, we've got moved on. Well, another another concern is the lack of ECC memory in these devices. Yeah, so I mean, there, there yes, I know e ECC memory is a, a big issue, but on, unless there is basically a guaranteed financial revenue stream, that's one of those things where if it, it's going to affect game, uh, you know, where the money comes from, that's so not. Do you see the problem here? Unless unless it is <laughs> good for games, it's not going to. Yeah, you know, but you know. That's, those are, these are the things that are keeping it from happening. Yeah, I mean, I, so I mean, it's, some of that mindset is changing, but unfortunately, the amount of dollars on one market <laughs> compared to the amount of dollars in the other market is, even if you able know, to capture a huge portion of the one market, one's, one's a lot more important than the other. <laughs> well, I don't know. I got to get my world of Warcraft on. <laughs> okay. So OpenCL is a specification that's been announced by Kronos. So Kronos is the same people who do OpenGL. They do, uh, there's a whole bunch of other open standards that they do. Uh, OpenCL will, was brought to Kronos by Apple, and they've said that, or publicly have announced that OpenCL will be part of Snow Leopard. Um, not giving you any secrets, you know, they've said it themselves. Um, so the Kronos group uh, basically uh, work together. So the Kronos group is a, um, you know, includes AMD, includes Intel, includes IBM, includes NVIDIA, includes Apple, and includes uh, surprisingly, some of the cell phone vendors, uh, so Blizzard, I believe, is a part of it. So there are lots of companies that are a member of the OpenCL group trying to make a specification that will work well. And the reason they want to do this is that you have CPUs on this side, which are uh, multiprocessor cores. They have very performance-driven single cores. And you have things like OpenMP. On the GPU side, you have very data-parallel applications and graphics APIs, shader languages, things like CUDA. 
Uh, and they're kind of driving this way, and the CPUs are driving that way. So OpenCL takes a heterogeneous computing approach. So its approach is that it's a language that will let you program parallel programming on CPUs and GPUs, and it's uh, from the get-go designed to be data parallel and task parallel. If you're interested in it, you can go to Kronos.org and get the specification for it. So the design behind OpenCL was that it would allow you to use all computational resources in a system. So that means that you could use CPUs, GPUs, uh, DSPs, cell processors, anything that has sort of a runtime for OpenCL. OpenCL would let you program that device and ex use to accelerate your data. Uh, as I just said, it, it supports data parallel and task parallel, which is actually pretty, uh, pretty good. It's C-based, not C++, C-based. Um, and it abstracts the specific, so the language that's used to program the devices themselves is C-based, and it's used, designed to abstract the specifics of the hardware and let you, you know, program in a, a relatively high-level language. While you have this abstraction for the language, the API itself is low-level. So it's a low-level, high-performance, um, device-independent language. So the reason is it's approachable, but it's really designed for experts. So if you're a beginning GPGPU programmer, it's not, it's not really meant for you. you. It's sort of expected you'll use libraries built on top of OpenCL. Uh, and there's no middleware or convenience function. So you know that, that's open source, that's companies, whatever. They can do convenience functions. So that would be something like a, you know, a wrapper library around it that makes things nice and easy for you. It's expected someone else will do that because it's not part of the core of OpenCL. It's actually implementable, implementable on a range of devices, so from HPC systems, embedded systems, desktop systems, and server systems. So it has profile mechanisms. So you can imagine one day you pull out your cell phone, it will be doing GPGPU, which actually, you know, at first people laugh, like, why would I want to do GPGPU on my phone? It actually makes sense because most processors and cell phones don't have floating point capability. You know, they, they actually don't have very much arithmetic ability, whereas the GPUs could do a lot more arithmetic operations. So image processing is one place where that you know, is very attractive. So taking pictures, I can do some image processing on the picture from the camera, and I actually have this little engine that can actually do computation uh, much more efficiently than the sort of main CPU of your cell phone. And it's designed to drive future hardware requirements. So there are specific floating point precision requirements for OpenCL. So it's designed to actually try to drive GPUs to have better requirements for things such as uh, floating point precision. So a question, is uh, OpenCL single socket multi-core? Is it you know, distributed memory? So I'll get to the memory um, uh, in a second. Yes. I'm just wondering why uh, OpenCL and CUDA are both, they're both C-based rather than C++-based. Is there some... Well, CUDA has actually a little bit C++ based, but I would say C1, I think, I would agree with, but Ken is my mind there, is, is a bit much. But um, so CUDA does actually support C++ uh, operations in the kernels. Okay. Um, it's just sort of, I would say, a design choice. But personally, I think C is, is probably the right choice because you can build things on top of it that provide. So again, it, it's designed to be a low level abstraction. So. You know, C++ templating, all this stuff might be a bit much. I know some people will disagree with me. <laughs> so the OpenCL sort of has three pieces. There's the language specification. So that's a C-based language. It's based on uh, C99 with extensions uh, and some limitations. So uh, one of the limitations is you cannot do recursion. Recursion is not allowed. The other thing is you cannot do function pointers. So no function pointers, no recursion. The extensions are things like float1, float2, float4. I mean, float one's not an extension, but float2, float4, float8, float16. So you have explicit SIMD types up to 16 wide. There is a defined numerical accuracy, so it's based on IEEE. It is not IEEE compliant, because what a lot of people don't realize is that full IEEE compliance for <laughs> entails a lot that is, so it's IEEE precision, it's just not fully IEEE compliant. Uh, one nice thing about OpenCL is it has online or offline compilation. So you can actually compile your programs online like you would do with GLSL or HLSL with DirectX, or you can do it offline. So offline you pre-compile it and you have a binary. And there's a rich set of built-in math functions. Basically anything in math.h is specified that, you, you, that is there. There's also a platform layer, so this lets you basically find out information about the hardware. So it abstracts uh, what kind of resources are there, what the hardware is, all that kind of information, so you can query, select the device, uh, and create compute contexts and work queues. Um, the runtime API is 
<coughs> excuse me, you execute kernels and you manage the scheduling, compute, and memory resources. So the three parts are the language, the API for actually getting a device, getting a command queue, and the API for executing kernels and managing scheduling compute resources. So we spent uh, you know, probably 15, 20 minutes in class talking about CUDA. Um, what do you see here that you think is different than CUDA? So this is very similar to CUDA, the driver API. The big one is there is no means in the CUDA driver API to do online compilation, which is there are actually lots of times when online compilation is, is pretty handy. That would probably be the, the biggest difference. Uh, and also, I, I, we'll get into it a little bit, but um, so OpenCL has the notion of queues, so you actually in queue work, whereas with uh, the CUDA driver API, you're launching a kernel. So in OpenCL, you actually have a queue and you in queue requests. So you basically say, in queue a read, in queue a kernel, in queue another kernel, in queue a write, in queue another kernel, in queue. And basically, you feed that to the runtime, and then it's going to basically go through this queue. So it has this explicit queuing system. Another difference is that uh, OpenCL has uh, this task parallelism model that's not uh, something that's exposed in It's out of the queues, like the queue sort of exposes that? You could take any piece of work out of the queue that is, has its dependencies mapped? Uh, so with OpenCL, there are two types of uh, queues. There's an in-order queue where everything that goes in will be executed in order, but there are also out-of-order queues. So you can explicitly create an out-of-order queue you queue in order, so you put things in order, but the runtime will pull out of the queue in any order at once. And then you have events that basically tell it which elements in the queue depend on other elements. And so it'll ma uh, maintain that, basically, th those dependencies for you. And there's also this task parallelism model as well. Yes? Uh, I'm assuming this needs hardware and driver support by newer, like, so an uh, older GPU would not be able to run any of this OpenCL stuff, would it? Right, there is a minimum set that OpenCL says that would be able, that would have to support it. So, yeah, if you look at a GPU from five years ago, no, it's not going to, it's not going to run on OpenCL. Like yeah. When your target device can have anywhere from 16 to 32 to 64 bytes MD, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you expect to abstract it to OpenCL, that concept? Because if you're writing a performance application, you'd much rather know that information right. and so use you, it. So there are, so, you know, so there are uh, query, so you can query your devices. Okay. And, and you know, <laughs> anyone who's basically, I mean, they're like basically cap bits, but you know, anyone who really wants to run as fast as possible. You, you might end up writing code for three different devices. Yes, but if you're actually just switching the size of things, in general, it's not going to be three separate sets of code. But yeah, you uh, could use templates. <laughs> <laughs> so th I guess that's a nice use of templates. But. I mean, we use templates for code generation. That's, that's right. Well, yeah. I mean, so uh, again, the language itself is designed to be low level and extensible. So if you want to make, if you want to write a C plus plus front end for it, I'm sure we could uh, we help you out. Okay, so the, the platform model is you have a host device and one or more compute devices. So since I'm more of GPU-centric, I want to speak of this from GPUs, but it could be other accelerators. So you have one or more compute devices. This would be a GPU. You have one or more compute units. That would be SIMDs. So this is a GPU, the, board, the ASIC. Okay. This is the SIMD, and then each of those has a processing element, which would be sort of the ALU. And your program... So you, you have kernels, the kernels run on the compute units, and then sort of your control program runs on the host. So I said, you know, a kernel is the basic execution that runs on the accelerator. Host programs, they're a collection of kernels. You can think of them as a library. One way of thinking about it, you know, you can ask it to do a matrix multiply. And matrix multiply might have one or more kernels that execute that operation. Kernel execution. The host program invokes kernels over what we call an ND range space. That's an index space. So ND range, which stands for n-dimensional uh, range, can be one, two, or three dimensions. So if I'm operating on a vector, I might do a 1D space. If I'm operating on an image, I might do a 2D space. If I'm operating on a volume, I could do a 3D space. So that's how you launch your programs in these spaces. A single instance in this index space is called a work item, which of course is different from CUDA, has a different name. Everything has to have a different name. So work items have a unique global ID. Work items are further grouped into work groups. And work groups have a unique work group ID, and you have a location in the global domain, and you have a location in the local work group domain. So let's say we want to process an image. 
We might make the width of it, the global size, the height of the image, the global height. Each of this global domain is split up into work groups. Each of these work groups has a work item, so everybody has an ID for the work, you know, inside the work group and inside the entire domain. Of course, you can compute your global ID from your local ID and um, block our work group ID. So if you've worked in CUDA, this should look very similar to you. Okay, context and queues. So contexts are used to contain and manage the state of the world. So context, I mean, this is pretty basic stuff. The big thing is the command queues. So we have execution of these kernel commands. Also, memory commands are enqueued into the command queues. So you enqueue memory move. If I read data from host memory and put it in GPU memory, so you enqueue that, you enqueue kernel executions, and then you could enqueue the write back. And so basically, when you enqueue all these commands, you can basically get an event back saying, when is this write done? And it'll tell you when that write's done. In this queue process, this queue manager, is this also managing the different devices? So if, if your one kernel is dependent upon some sort of memory ops that you're doing, you can send those memory ops to a second device. So uh, you would there are events that you use. So you have to explicitly manage the synchronization. Okay. So uh, OpenCL uses lazy semantics as far as this goes, and it's up to the developer to set the events to make sure. So you can basically... Uh, the best thing, I won't probably have time to get to it, but if you go to the specification, you'll see all the enqueue commands take a list of events that you depend on, and you generate an event, which is what, you know, what your, your event. And so you can basically have graphs of how everything depends. And so it's up to you, the developer, to do that. Great. Um, so you ha there are in-order queues and out-of-order queues. So uh, they are queued in-order and executed in-order or out-order based on whether what kind of queue you created and use these events. Uh, one thing I don't think I have in the slides, but that's kind of interesting, is that there's also a task parallelism model. And so with the task parallelism model, you can explicitly run a, um, a kernel in a task parallel way, which only has one work item and one work group. So it's more of like a sequential C thread. Another nice thing about uh, OpenCL is you can actually enqueue native functions in this task parallelism model. So you can actually have a native C function that is enqueued into the OpenCL runtime. So you can actually use it to manage threads for you if you, you, know, you don't want to use P threads or whatever. So earlier there was a question about the memory model. So it's going to look very similar to uh, other GPU compute models where you have a global memory, which is a global memory for the device. Not shown is a host memory and you do explicit transfers between those. On the compute device, there will be constant memory. There will also be a local memory, which is shared by compute units. So it's a shared local memory, a local data share, we'll say. And then your work compute unit might have multiple work items, and each work item has a private memory. So this is sort of scratch space per work item. All right. I have five minutes? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll go through a quick example. All right, so a generic OpenCL program will consist of this. You'll, compare, you'll query compute devices. Say, hey, OpenCL, what compute devices are there? Create some contexts. That corresponds to the platform API in green here. Then I will create some memory objects, uh, compile, create my program online if I want, issue commands to my command queue, do synchronization, clean up my OpenCL resources. That's the runtime. That's sort of the second part of OpenCL. And then my kernel would be written in this restricted subset of C99. That's the language. So let's say we want to do simple vector addition. We want to do A plus B equals C. <clears throat> if you were doing this you know, simply on a single core CPU, you'd probably just write a for loop for I equals 0 to the number of elements, loop through that, basically get an element of A, get an element of B, write it to, to C. So this is sort of the most simplistic way of doing vector add. If you think about it, this for loop, that's the index space. So I have an index space, a 1D index space. This is an image, it might be a 2D index space. Volume would be a 3D index space. My kernel of computation is just C equals A plus B. That's all, you know, all my computation there. So my OpenCL kernel is going to look very similar to that. Basically, I get my ID in my space. I get a value from A, get a value from B, add them together, write it to C. So this kernel does that same computation that's in that for loop. So if you look, you know, basically, that computation corresponds to that. Yes? What's the zero? The zero. Oh, so get global ID of dimension zero. So there would be a global ID dimension one and a global ID dimension two, depending on whether you're one, two, or three D. Yeah. Uh, 
And there, I mean, there are a lot of built-in functions such as git local or uh, git workgroup ID, all, all sorts of things like that. Okay. Yeah, so it's, and then the host code would look something like this. Basically, create a context. So it's all C calls. So that's one thing is, so uh, John, you were asking earlier about the difference between sort of uh, CUDA and OpenCL. And that it's, so especially when using the sort of Chevron syntax in CUDA, it, you have to do a compiler and then compile. So you basically, compile wants to generate C, which is then compiled. So OpenCL is a library. So you compile the library, you compile once. You can do an offline compile of your kernel, but your main host program is never touched by the runtime because OpenCL itself is a library that is called through library functions. So you could easily conceive of things built on top of this that give you sort of the syntactic sugar that something like uh, other languages give. So basically, we create context. Um, we get some context info. We create this command queue. Um, I would, I mean, this is actually online. So if you go to sa08. Dot, uh, well, you can send it out, actually. Uh, it, or I can it, send it out. It's a UC Davis machine, and I can, I can point you guys So there's to. a lot of these presentations that go over OpenCL, because we're almost out of time here. So, um, so you, you, know, you basically create a program, you build your program, create the kernel. Um, you set your arguments. So you set A, set B, set C. So again, it's a C API, so you have to explicitly set these things. You can always have something on the outside that makes this look nicer. You could conceive of utility so I'll do this all for you. And then you NQ your ND range curl. So one thing uh, earlier, so I'm waiting on zero events. I pass it null, and I don't care about my event handle. But right here, we could pass in 10 events, handles to 10 events to wait on, and then get a handle back that would tell that you would use later on. So if you had lots of things going in parallel that depended on each other, you would explicitly manage that. Um, and then you basically read the output data. And again, it has events that handle to wait on. OK. I will stop there, because I think I'm out of time. And are there, let me show one last thing. So I'm going to show a video of a demo that we actually showed at SIGGRAPH Asia. The reason I'm showing a video is that this only has two cores on it, so it's not as interesting. So this is a little program called Powder Toy that I ported to OpenCL. The initial port took about an hour to two hours to do the initial port of the fluid flow. So it's a particle fluid flow simulator. So these are all particles. That's gunpowder being dropped down. Uh, the display in the background is the, basically uh, pressure from what's going on. So I'm dropping gunpowder. And um, basically, this is the sim time in OpenCL. So this is how much time is being <laughs> spent in OpenCL. So I have metal, I'm dropping lava, the gunpowder explodes. You get a nice little movement of things. The wood catches on fire. Uh, and then we get the metal basically starting to melt. So that's how much. And this is running on one core right now. So this is a single core of a Phenom 2 system uh, running. And so this is a material that clones whatever touches it. So whatever material touches it first, it'll constantly emit that. So I have gas, gasoline basically that I can touch it with, so it's emitting gas constantly, and then I can catch it on fire. And then this stuff will heat up and basically create high pressure and force the outflow of these little 2D particles, and so it nice, makes this nice little spewing fire thing. Um, these are on breakable walls. And so this is running on one core. So you can't see it, but it's running three milliseconds right now on one core. I had to do this with no voiceover for an online video, so that's why it does this. <laughs> so we have one core. Um, so that's three milliseconds per iteration of this. Yeah, three milliseconds for the simulation, for the open seal portion of the simulation. So if you notice, I just, I just hit a button, and it changes an environment variable. And at one time, I can go to two cores. So I don't have to restart the program. don't have to change code. I just change an environment variable. And it went down to 1.6 milliseconds. So it's not completely linear, but it's pretty close to linear. So that's on two cores, it was 1.6. Now it's running on three cores, it's 1.2. I can actually go to four cores, but Fraps ends up sucking down one entire core of the system. So <laughs> unfortunately, when you go to four cores, it, it actually gets a little bit slower because Fraps is doing its thing. So uh, we've actually had this run on a Linux box with eight CPU or eight cores, and it was seven, a little over seven, 7.6 7 of scaling. So it's almost linear. There's definitely a little bit of a hit. Um, so this is OpenCL running on our optimized CPU runtime. <laughs>
So we have both CPU and GPU runtimes we're working on. But you know, the CPU, you know, this is actually open is a great way to program multiple cores because once you start having eight cores or 16 cores, it's actually pretty hard to write threaded code that takes advantage of all those cores. So OpenCL is a nice way of doing that because conceptually you are programming lots of things at once and it will parallelize uh, quite well on multiple cores. So I think I took a little over time, so any questions? So how about we thank our speaker. Oh. I know some of you have classes to get to, but I hope he'll stick around for a few minutes and uh, answer questions offline. So you said you're important.